All righty, we've gone live. Excellent. Participants are streaming in. Alrighty, uh, this is the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Thank you for uh, signing into this webinar. We've got a few minutes before we're going to start. Uh, the for those of you that have been on this uh, webinar series, you know we've done about 33 of them now. And just a reminder that your CE credits will be coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry. Those will be emailed to you within the next two or three days. Please save that PDF just in case there's any uh, issues down the road with those CE credits. Those of you that are AGD members, we will be reporting your CE credits directly to the Academy of General Dentistry. Those will go on your transcripts in the next two to four weeks. Uh, we'd like to thank all our co-sponsors. That includes Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Seattle King County Dental Society. We'd like to thank Comet USA and Patterson Dental, as well as the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. Today's webinar is actually uh, co-sponsored by the University of Washington School of Dentistry AGD student chapter. Our student chapter hosts um, three CE events every quarter, including um, uh, and also a social hour. So we have four events for our students. One of those events is usually a uh, day-long hands-on course. We've hosted Dr. Michael Fling in the past, Dr. Gian Kim, and myself. And so we've branched out, we've created a digital dental uh, study club and one of our speakers we asked uh, to present was Dr. Ann. And unfortunately, we're out because of COVID-19. So he agreed to do this webinar for us today. Uh, you're going to love this presentation. I saw uh, it in Chicago. It is one of the most clear, concise uh, lectures on intraoral scanning. So thank you very much for joining us. You'll notice there's some flyers going by. Uh, there's QR codes on many of those flyers and those will uh, take you to the registration link for uh, the different webinars and presentations. If that doesn't work for you, go to www.washingtonagd.org and you'll be able to register there. Also, if you go to that uh, website, you'll be able to just click on the YouTube channel link and that'll take you directly to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry uh, YouTube channel. There are the webinars that we've been doing for this uh, series, the Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. And those will be on there for a period of a, a few weeks anyway, uh, before they disappear. You can share those uh, webinars uh, with your staff members if you'd like. Um, you can, unfortunately, we will not be able to grant you CE credit for watching a YouTube video. Uh, we can only grant CE credit for those of you that uh, log in and uh, do these webinars live. Um, we encourage anybody that's not an AGD member to become an AGD member. Uh, it's been a great organization that really is focused on continuing education for the general dentists. We aren't using the raise the hand feature here today. Uh, we will be using the Q&A feature. Um, so if you have a question, please type it in uh, the Q&A uh, chat window there. And, uh, we, and we get to the end of the presentation, we'll uh, give those questions to Dr. Ann. 
Uh, just to distinguish, if you look around your Zoom app, you'll see that there's Q&A and there's a, a chat feature. We're going to use the Q&A for the questions. Chat is just for uh, Dr. Hayamoto to uh, type in some links and give other, other information because a lot of people jump on these uh, webinars a little late, so uh, they're not uh, up to speed. Um, CE credit will be coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry. We've already covered that but we'll just give it a minute or so here and then um, give everybody a chance to get in, get familiar with their Zoom app. If you're not hearing things uh, or well on your side, it's an adjustment on your side. We've tested the audio here, the panelists and the uh, presenter, Dr. Ann, are all coming through loud and clear. Um, those of you that are on Wi-Fi sometimes will have uh, troubles connecting uh, and getting the full advantage out of the Zoom interface. Um, you can't hurt this Zoom interface, so if you get knocked off because you click on something incorrectly, just use your uh, registration login again and you can jump right back on. Uh, we've got over 400 participants uh, that are logged in so far, and uh, so we'll give just a couple of minutes here and just see how we're doing. Yeah, oh, it's continuing to click up. Next week, we've got kind of an interesting week. We've got the International Academy of Nathology that have put together speakers for us on Monday. On Tuesday, the Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry have put together uh, three speakers as well. And on Thursday, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics have put uh, together three speakers. So we thank our uh, co-sponsors and we thank those organizations for helping us out. Alrighty, it gives me great pleasure to uh, say thank you to all our presenters that have helped us out on the WAGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. All of our presenters are, uh, have donated their time. So there's no honorariums being paid. So we are so thankful in this, uh, during this pandemic that they've done that for us. Uh, really have been some solid webinars. So please take a look at YouTube uh, on our back catalog and also look at these flyers, what's coming up and who's coming up. There is some great topics. Um, this is a CE that's available to everyone. You do not need to be an AGD member. You can be a dentist, you can be a hygienist, assistant, a staff member, a front desk, whatever. Uh, we will be issuing you CE credit to the email address that you registered at. So uh, be looking in the next two to three days for an email from the University of Washington CE department. Uh, you may want to check your spam or your junk uh, email. Uh, if you don't see anything. And then AGD members, we will report your credits directly to the Academy of General Dentistry. And you'll see those on your transcripts uh, in the next two to four weeks. Our sponsors, again, University of Washington School of Dentistry, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Seattle King County Dental Society, Comet USA, uh, Patterson Dental and the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce an alumni from the University of Washington. Dr. Ann is currently Assistant Professor of Prostodontics and Director of the Digital Dentistry Curriculum at Marquette University School of Dentistry. He received his BAS in Statistics and Computer Science and DDS from Seoul National University in South Korea. He completed his prostodontic residency at the University of Washington School of Dentistry, where he received his certificate in prostodontics and MSD. He is a diplomate of the American Board of Prostodontics, a fellow of the American College of Prostodontists, and a member of the American Academy of Fixed Prostodontics. Dr. Ann has served as an editorial board member of the Journal of Prostodontics and a reviewer for other scientific journals. Dr. Ann has authored and co-authored scientific articles in various peer-reviewed journals. His research and clinical interests include the CAD-CAM dental technology and implant dentistry. His lectures mainly focus on digital dentistry, implant dentistry, and aesthetic reconstruction. 
Dr. Ann, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Uh, and on behalf of our University of Washington School of Dentistry uh, student AGG chapter, thank you, thank you for donating your time. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for a um, nice introduction. So I'm in Wisconsin, Milwaukee now, I'm talking to uh, WAGD, I feel like I'm back to Seattle. <laughs> I miss Seattle so much. Um, thank you all for coming here. It's a great pleasure to have a chance to speak here today. I think um, uh, what this program, the WAGD and Dr. Hess is, is making a great contribution to our community uh, by doing this. Um, so the um, topic that I have today is intro scanning. I think uh, uh, most of you are here uh, either uh, because either you're using internal scanner now or at least interested in using internal scanner. So thank you all for being here. Um, do you see my screen now? Y yes, we do. It, it looks okay. good. All right. Yep. All right. All right. So um, that we're going to be talking about internal scanning. So, you know, I, I've been in my, many presentation um, talking about intro scanning as well. And then uh, you can talk about many different aspects of intro scanning, but um, I'm not here to talk about how great it is or how fast I can make an intro scan and things like that. Today, I'll be focusing more on uh, how to control the quality of your intro scanning. In other words, I'm going to talk more about how to make an accurate intro scan. We also will have a chance to talk about when to and when not to use intro scanning. And at the end of presentation, I'll be able to uh, present some of the cases that we did here in Marquette University using intro scanner. All right, so let's uh, talk about intro scanning. Before we talk about intro scanning, let's first think about this. Uh, we make dental impression every day, but why do we make an impression? Why do we bother making an impression? Because it's, it's a little, little bit of work. Well, the answer is very simple. We make an intro, um, dental impression in order to do lab work in order to do lab procedures in the lab instead of patient mouth. If you can directly wax in your patient mouth, you don't have to make an impression. You can do everything in patient mouth. However, it is not possible. So you have to make an impression to transfer what you have in your mouth in your lab bench so then you can work on your lab bench instead of your patient mouth. If you want to use CAD CAM technology to design and fabricate your restoration, you're going to have to find a way to transfer what you have in your patient mouth to your computer instead of lab bench. In other words, you will have to find a way to digitize your patient mouth into the format that patient, uh, your computer can recognize and process as well. And that's what the scanning is all about. There are two different ways of doing that. First, you can directly scan your patient mouth. It's called intro scanning or direct scanning or digital impression is all the same thing. Another way of doing that is um, make an impression and pour up the stone model, and then you scan either stone model or your impression. It's called extra scanning, indirect scanning, laboratory scanning, desktop scanning. It's all the same thing. Today, we'll be more focusing more on uh, intro scanning. So uh, the way that intro scanner works is very simple. It has a little tips, and at this tip of the scanner, it keeps taking this little three-dimensional pictures. And that's step number one, and these are all three-dimensional image capture. And tip is very small. You, you, not, you will not be able to take the picture of a whole mouth with this small tip. So those small pictures are sent to the computer. Um, depending on type of scanner you use, it normally takes about 10 to 25 pictures per second. So those small pictures are sent to the computer, and computer will put those pictures together and create the full arch scan, as you can see on the right side of the screen. And that's step number two, a reconstruction of three-dimensional data. We're going to talk about two different steps one by one. Let's first talk about first step, the image capturing. As you can see here, different scanners use different image capturing technologies to capture the surface. So, the, you know, I spent a significant time and an effort to learn about all these different technologies. And the conclusion that I made at the end was uh, maybe dentists don't really need to know about all these different technologies in detail. Because the truth is, we as a dentist don't even have enough background knowledge to understand this. We, we're, not, we're not engineer or science, 
you know, this uh, uh, expert in this optical science. But uh, one thing that you really need to pay attention to though, one thing that you really need to know is that every single dental scanner out there use some kind of light to scan the object. Every single commercially available intro dental scanner is optical scanner, which means it uses a light to scan the object. If you're using light to scan the object, there are things that you need to deal with just because you're using light. If you have a, if you have a light and if you have an object, the light is hitting, you're gonna have a reflection. If you have a light passing from one medium to another, you're gonna have a refraction. If you have a light and if something is in the way, you're gonna create a shadow. These are the things that you have to deal with no matter what kind of scanner you have, as long as your scanner use a light to scan the object. So let's talk about this one by one. First, let's first think about reflection. Reflection is very important because that's what makes your scanner work. The way the scanner works is at the tip of the scanner, there is a little part that generates the light, to produce the light, and then the light will be projected on the surface of the object that you want to scan and it's reflected back to the tip of the scanner. And there is a part that received the light at the tip as well. And then the received light will be analyzed. The by analyzing the pattern of reflection, the scanner can figure out how the surface looks like. So reflection is what you need to scan the object. So here you're looking at two different types of reflection and specular reflection and um, uh, diffuse reflection as well. So um, the way that I took those photos were I was holding this uh, stone model right above the water, of course, under, under different condition and took this photo. So you see this reflected image as well. And the, uh, what, what kind of reflection do you think you need to scan the object more clearly? In other words, uh, in what photo can you see the image more clearly? What I meant by the image though is not the reflected image of the model, the, the object that I wanna scan here is the surface of water. So in what photo can you see how the surface of water looks like more clearly? You can see it more clearly in diffuse reflection, right? So that's what you need. You need diffuse reflection to scan the object with a higher accuracy. In specular reflection, the pattern of reflection is basically determined by angle of incidence rather than the surface morphology. So it doesn't give you a lot of information about how the surface looks like. But in a diffuse reflection, the pattern of reflection is mainly determined by the surface morphology. So it gives you more information to your computer uh, to calculate with and then figure out how the surface looks like. Then when do we have diffuse reflection? We have diffuse reflection when we have a rough and matte surface. So when do we have a, uh, a specular reflection then? When we have a shiny and glossy surface question is then, do we have shiny glossy surface in our mouth? Of course we do. Every, um, I mean, everything is shiny in our mouth. So um, those shiny objects in our mouth is known to lower your scanning accuracy a little bit. Another thing that can uh, lower your scanning accuracy is highly translucent object. If you have a translucent object that uh, when, when you have a light, the, the reflection uh, doesn't happen at the surface of the object. You actually go through the surface, go underneath the surface, and gets reflected underneath the surface. It's called a subsurface scattering. Because of this, it's also known to cause a little bit of inaccuracy. The question is then, how much inaccuracy does it cause? Well, uh, luckily, the amount of inaccuracies you will have by scanning shiny or translucent objects is most of the time is within clinically acceptable range. So you don't really need to worry too much about it. You can just go ahead and scan most of the object in our mouth. For example, ceramics, enamels, yes, they are shiny, but normally uh, it can be scanned within, uh, within the clinically acceptable accuracy. Um, the, the worst thing that you can scan is actually a highly polished metal. So like highly polished gold cone, it basically is like a mirror. So like a, more than 90% of specular reflection, you get it um, get, um, from the, that kind of surfaces. So what, what if you have a little gold in there? Is that a problem? Uh, no, it's not actually. What if you have a little single gold crown? Can you scan it? Yeah, if you go a little slowly, you will be able to scan it with no problem. 
What if you have uh, three gold crowns in a row? That can be a little difficult to scan. Here I'm trying to scan number uh, 29 single crown, and then this patient has 30 and 31 full cast gold crown. And then as you can see here, the scanner is not picking up that very well. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to scan the uh, anterior area first. So I went ahead and scanned the anterior area. And then I came back to posterior area to scan number 30 and 31 again. And as you can see here, the computer uh, scanner is not picking that up and keep uh, stopping there. So after playing with this scanner for about another couple of minutes, this is all I got. What if I really need that second molar? What if I really, really, really need to scan the surface? Then, well, you can go back to the old fashioned way. If you apply powder, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of surface you have underneath, this powder will get rid of all this specular reflection and make all the different types of surface equal and then get rid of all this uh, translucency as well. So you can scan the surface with a higher accuracy. So if you have a powder system like 3M True Definition, you can just use a powder and don't think about surface at all. If you have a powder list system, which is trend now, then you can go ahead and, um, you don't need to use this powder for most of the cases, but it's not a bad idea to have this powder ready in your office, just in case, because we sometimes see patient has gold restoration everywhere and, and you know they tend to last long right so uh, we talked about the reflection and another thing that can generate excessive reflection is actually the lighting condition what kind of lighting condition are you using to scan, scan your patient uh, as you can see here there are studies um, looking into the accuracy of scanner under different lighting condition um, the first study was also done by our alumni uh, Marta Revisa um, so the, uh, the good thing is, good news is, uh, um, room light works just fine for the most of the scanner. So, uh, that's good news because we don't have to do anything differently. We can just use regular room light setting that we use every day in clinic. The only thing that you need to be careful is not to use a chair light. If you use a chair light, that's way too much light and create, um, too much of the reflection that can become noise, um, when you scan. So this is a typical scan made under chair light. You can see the excessive reflection created a lot of error on the surface of the that you want to, uh, you're scanning. All right, so we talked about reflection. And second, let's talk about refraction. So images that you're seeing on your left side really show us what happened when light goes through water. Uh, I was told many, many times by those trainers that manufacturers sent me um, um, that I don't have to dry the surface. I don't have to remove saliva when I scan because their scanner will scan through saliva. Uh, that is true. The scanners will scan through saliva. You know what else is true? And that lowers your scanning accuracy significantly. And the amount of error that you can get by scanning through saliva, as you can see here, is not something clinically acceptable. It's 300 to 1600 micron, which is 1.6 millimeter. That, that's not acceptable error in dentistry. So, you know, if you're making scans just for fun, yeah, go ahead and then scan through saliva. But if, but if you actually want to have an accurate scan, you have to dry the surface, especially the critical area, like your crown preparation, you have to dry surface. You don't have to dry like a crazy, but you have to remove excess water on the surface to get an accurate scan. These are scans made by our students and then uh, critical errors in a critical um, area like a crown finish line because of a little saliva, a little uh, bleeding. Um, this is not something that uh, you can um, be based on to make a, a, a dental restoration. Um, another thing, so let's talk about shadow. So as we all know, light travels only on a straight line. So because of that, and then our mouth has complex anatomy. Because of that, there are areas that you will not be able to scan because light simply doesn't get in there. Depending on the scan angulation and then how uh, big their mouth opening is, typical area that you would be missing is this um, distal third molars and and some in approximal areas and the base of the uh, bridge ponics and things like that. No, most of the time, those areas are not, not very critical, so it will still give a, 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 a clinically acceptable enteral scanning. And one area that you commonly miss without even knowing that you're missing actually is uh, this deep subgingival finish line. 
when you have a deep subdivision finish line like this, how, how difficult do you think it is to capture this finish line with a PBS impression? Uh, you would normally use, I, I normally use a double core technique in a situation like this, and then it is very difficult to capture the finish line perfectly, but it is not impossible though, because we, we, we somehow managed to do this uh, in a situation like this. If you ask me how difficult it is to scan this, um, Based on my experience, I think it's 20 times more difficult scanning this than capturing this with a PBS impression. So when you have intro scan of the deep subgingival margin looking like this, you may think you have everything. You may think you may capture everything, but if you look at it closely, and this is a superimposed image of your intro scan and PBS impression, you can clearly see the margin marked on your, your intro scan is a significantly shorter than um, that of previous impression. The reason is the gingiva around the finish line was basically uh, working as a wall that blocked the light to create a shadow. So that area here, this much was the shadow, the light couldn't get in there. So that's why, um, and then computer didn't like this having void, so filled uh, this void automatically and make everything smooth and they makes you feel like you captured everything but truth is you are missing this finish line. Uh, this was made by our student and then using 3M True Definition Scanner, which is one of the few scanners that doesn't uh, fill out the void automatically. So you can actually see where the missing area is and you see this patient was missing, uh, this student was missing uh, uh, scans on the finish line uh, almost all the way around. So this is not something that you can use to make your crown and ex expect that a good accuracy around your restoration. So uh, intro scanning works best when you have a super gingival margin. Uh, even if you have a equal gingival or slightly sub gingival margin, if you use whatever retraction tool you like to use, I, I, I like using just conventional core technique, but if you, uh, whatever retraction uh, tool that you have, if you can get tissue retracted, you will be able to capture all the finish line nicely. But when you have a deep subgingival margin, I'm not saying it's impossible, it can be done, but uh, PVS impression can be, uh, uh, I think, a lot more predictable way of doing that. I've seen people doing laser gingivectomy to cut gingiva away and then get capture um, finish line. It certainly can be done, but I don't really see why, because I can just make PVS impression. Why would you traumatize tissue? You can just make an impression. All right, so um, summarizing what I've been talking about, you know, um, if you look at it, except the lighting condition, if you look at it, none of this uh, looks, uh, looks new to you, right? Because this is what you do every day when you make an impression anyway. So I'm, I'm telling you this again, because I was told many times by many different people, I have to tell you this, when it comes to intro scanning, there are so many fake experts out there. So I've told many times by many different people saying that I don't have to do any of this if I buy their scanners. That simply is not true. It doesn't matter what scanner you have, as long as it's an optical scanner, which is the case, you have to do this to control the quality of your image capture. All right, so we talked about the controlling uh, image capture. So now let's move to the second topic. So uh, once you capture the image, what will happen next is this captured image will be sent to the computer and computer will put those little images together to create the larger image as you can see on the right side. Again, it takes about 10 to 25. I think the recent scanners can take up to 28 or 30 uh, pictures per second, um, but a lot of pictures. It's a lot more than we can, you know, we as a human eye can recognize, but a lot, it takes a lot of pictures per seconds and then uh, send this to the computer. Some uh, scanners will take a little more than others. So they say we're actually doing continuous video recording and some scanners will take a little picture than others. So they say they just take multiple pictures, but the way this works is not different. You all know that video is basically a multiple image. So uh, the way it works is not uh, not very different. So uh, let's let's say that we're trying to scan uh, uh, the patient mouth that you're seeing on the left side of the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start scanning from the facial side of number eight here. So I take my I start scan there and I take my first picture and this picture is sent to the computer and then computer will randomly put this picture somewhere in the middle. 
And then I move my scanner tip slightly to the right side of the screen and then the scanner will take second picture and then the second picture also will be sent to the computer. And at this point, computer doesn't know where to put this picture. So what computer will do first is computer will put those two pictures together and then try to identify where the common area between two images is. So once it find, once you figure out where the common area is, using the common area as a reference, computer will superimpose these two images, as you can see on the right side of the screen. As I move my scanner tip to the right side of this patient mouth, this will happen again, 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 and again. And then you are starting to build the three dimensional images, as you can see on the right side of the screen. And then if you cover all the area at the end, you can get a completely scanned arch, as you can see on the right side of the screen. So now we understand how this works. Now let's, um, my question is then, okay, I understand how this works, then is that really an accurate way of making scan? Is that really accurate? What is the accuracy about here? If you think about it, first it is about how accurate the individual image captures are, which we talked about already. And, but another thing that we also need to think about is even if individual image captures are accurately made, if the superimpositions of those images were not accurate, then overall image can still be distorted. So it's just, it is, it's not just about the accuracy of individual image capture, it is also about uh, how accurate the superimpositions between images are when it comes to the final, um, the, uh, the outcome accuracy uh, wise. So um, now we're going to talk about the superimposition, um, how to control the quality of a superimposition. So before we talk about superimposition, let's first know about uh, how three-dimensional images are superimposed. So I guess most of you know what this is. You probably don't know or remember how to do this, but you know at least what this is. When you have a multiple points like this, the linear regression analysis is to find a linear equation that would minimize the squared sum of, uh, sum of squared errors at each point. So um, the, the superimposition of three-dimensional data is basically a complex three-dimensional version of superimposition. So when you have two different scan, one and two, like this, this scan was, it's a scan of same object. It was scanned by using same uh, scanner, but the scanning accuracy is not 100%. So if you look at them under micron level, they are slightly different. They don't perfectly match. So, what a computer will do, the computer will put them together uh, in a way that you can minimize sum of squared error at each point. Uh, everybody would know that STL is basically the point cloud. And then uh, what computer will do next is, and then computer will calculate that an average image that best represent these two images superimposed on top of each other. Then number, uh, image number one and two are superimposed. That's how the superimposition works. Knowing that, let's uh, start thinking about this. We have a little Lego block that I want to scan here. So I want to scan from the left side. So I start scan there and the computer uh, scanner takes the first picture and send that first picture to the computer. And I move my scanner to slightly to the right side and take second picture. And then the second picture is sent to the computer as well. And then forget about Lego block. You know how this Lego block looks like because you just saw it, but your computer doesn't know how this Lego block looks like. And think about how these two images can be superimposed in your computer. Can you tell what the right superimposition is here? I think it's very obvious that number two is the right superimposition. If you cannot see number two is the right one, um, I don't know, you may have to play with the Lego a little more. Um, number two is a right superimposition and your computer knows it. You will get a very super accurate superimposition of two images. Uh, how about this? Now I'm scanning this Lego block again, but this time I'm not scanning the occlusal surface of Lego block. I'm going to scan the extra wall of the Lego block. So I'm scanning, I uh, make my first picture scan and then this first picture is sent to the computer and also second picture is sent to the computer and forget about Lego block, your computer doesn't know how the actual of Lego block looks like. Now think about how you're gonna merge them together. Can you tell what the right one is here? 
anything can be right, anything can be wrong here. Your computer cannot find, cannot figure out what the right one is in a case like this. It will somehow put those two images together, but it will be very random. It will not be accurate. So what was the difference then? What, what was the difference? The difference is whether you have a clear landmarks, clear anatomy that allow your computer to superimpose those images together with a higher accuracy or not. So generally speaking, the more surf complex, the more complex the surface morphology is, the more accurate superimposition you can have as a result, the more accurate internal scanning you can make. Um, it sounds a little different from what we believe in a conventional impression, but you need uh, complex anatomy. You need ins and outs, you need ups and downs. You cannot just make a good scan of the uh, of flat surface. So knowing that, and let's think about this. We're dentists, we're not gonna scan Lego blood, we're gonna scan our patient mouth. So here you're looking at two different areas, teeth and a edentulous area. If you think about, uh, think three dimensionally, if you think about uh, superimposing three dimensional images acquired from two different areas, areas, which area do you think you have a better anatomy for superimposition? Um, you can clearly see that teeth have better anatomy for superimposition. If you look at the soft tissue area, uh, everything is flat. There is no cusps or there's no grooves or anything. So it's not very different from axial wall of your Lego block. So it is known, there are many studies showing that accuracy that you're getting by scanning soft tissue is not as great as that of, uh, um, 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 it's not, is not as great as what you get when you scan your uh, teeth. Um, another thing, um, you use the same logic. Here we're looking at a closer surface of molars and also facial surface of incisors as well. And which area do you think you have a better anatomy for superimposition? Of course, the closer surface has better anatomy for superimposition. Facial surface of the two uh, incisors, basically it just looks like axial well, of the lab blood. There is no anatomy. So, uh, our closer surface scan is a lot more accurate than buccal surface scan. We're gonna uh, come back to this later and talk more about it when we talk about scanning path. So um, another thing that I wanna talk about is the scan length. Let's say that you wanna scan this mandible. So I wanna sc start scan from the patient left side. So I take my first picture and I might, might move my scanner tip a little to the medial side and I take my second picture and those two pictures are superimposed. And then as scanning accuracy is not 100%, uh, let's say that I created about one micron of error as I superimpose them together. Uh, do I care about this one micron? No, I don't. It's not clinically significant. So I keep going and then I take third picture and this third picture is superimposed again. And by doing so, I created another micron of error. So total, I have two microns of error. Do I care about two microns? No, I don't, it's clinically insignificant. But the problem is though, as I keep doing this, as I keep doing this, I'll keep accumulating this clinically insignificant errors again and again and again. So maybe at some point, maybe when, I, when I'm um, scanning the other side of the arch, maybe at some point, the total amount of error that I've been accumulating might become clinically significant. So uh, generally speaking, um, the longer the scan distances, the more potential inaccuracy you can have. So we say uh, the accuracy of intraoral scanning is distant dependent. So um, knowing that, let's think about this. Um, how long can your scan be then? How long can it be? It, can it be 16 tooth long. Yeah, if you have a third molar on each side, you can have a 16 tooth long scan. Can it be longer than that? What if I do this? What if I uh, scan along the buccal surface and then scan along the lingual surface, as you can see here, and then my buccal and lingual scan does not have any overlap? Don't you think this is 32 tooth long, actually? It's not 16 tooth long. 
Um, so if you look at these two different scan, um, the scan on your left side, the scan was made along the occlusal surface, which has a good anatomy that will allow you to make a good superimpositions. And this is a 16 tooth long scan. And if you look at the uh, scan on your right side of the screen, the scan was made along the buccal surface and lingual surfaces of tooth, which basically has no anatomy. Everything is flat and smooth there. And this is a 32 tooth long scan. So this is the same patient. You make, you make this scan by, uh, with the same scanner, but you're looking at a completely different level of accuracy here. What do you think if you, cause so the errors will be accumulated as you scan all the way like this. What do you think will happen if you try to merge those images together right there? What, what will typically happen is this. This is what we call a double image. So this is happening because the uh, scan from two different directions are not being merged nicely because the, the amount of error that you've been accumulating by scanning through the flat surfaces are now larger than what, uh, uh, what larger than the computer can compensate by using whatever internal algorithm that it has. So, uh, you know, this is the, how the whole scan looks like. And I, I made this scan intentionally to see if this is happening that then of course it does. So this lingual scan here, uh, the, uh, you, I scanned through this uh, soft tissue. There's no good anatomy, everything is flat. The buccal scan also here is not, um, doesn't have nice anatomy, so everything is relatively flat. So here I'm trying to merge them together and then this frequency was too big, the computer couldn't uh, merge them together with the high accuracy. So this is a 3M true definition scanner. So some of you may think uh, uh, I use a trios all the time, I, this never happened to me. Well, here we have a trios. Same here, this is where the error starts and these two images didn't have enough overlap when scan was made. So these errors are being accumulated all the way back and then it becomes here, maybe this is like a four or five millimeter of uh, errors. So and this is not something that you can use to make any type of dental restoration. Another example here, you see this long flat eventless uh, area. So as you scan this area, you will see that um, uh, you will see nice image. Scanner will show you nice image as you scan this eventual area. So you may feel like you're making accurate scan, but internally you're accumulating a lot of errors by scanning this flat and smooth surface. And at some point, the amount of accumulator error is big, uh, is larger than what computer can compensate or fix. Then suddenly, computer will show this kind of double image because computer doesn't know how to fix this at some point. So why, do I sh uh, why am I showing all these uh, errors? Well, to talk about how to prevent that. So let's talk about uh, what we need to do to prevent this, to, con to control the quality of superimpositions. The first, um, um, we can do what we call S-type scan. So use your scanner, uh, move your scanner to, to buccal, lingual, buccal, occlusal, lingual, occlusal, buccal, lingual, buccal, lingual, like this. So by doing that, what you're doing is um, you're building a nice three-dimensional anatomy a little by little. You're not just scanning through the flat surface. You can make sure that you're building nice three-dimensional anatomy little by little as you go that way and keep revisiting the occlusal surface that has a good anatomy. One thing that you need to make sure is you need to make sure that your new scan has a significant amount of overlap with your uh, previously scanned area. So uh, as you... Uh, as you scan this way, you can get a very accurate scan of the area that you want to scan. Uh, the problem with this uh, strategy is though, you have to keep moving your scanner to buccal lingual. It, is, it takes long to do this. And also, if patient has a little limited mouth opening, this can be a little difficult to do. So this is a very accurate way of making scanning, but this is not most efficient way of making drill scanning. Another thing you can do is scanning the occlusal surface first and then add lingual and buccal as you can see here. The point of doing that is if you scan occlusal surface first, the occlusal surface has a good occlusal anatomy, complex anatomy that will allow you to superimpose images with a higher accuracy. So by just scanning the occlusal surface, you're creating a great uh, initial scan with a great accuracy. This is what I call initial backbone. So once you have a nice 
uh, accurate backbone, you can just go ahead and add flashes there. So, uh, <coughs> and add your lingual and a buckle surface scan to your occlusal scan, then you can uh, complete uh, the scan um, and maintain the initial accuracy that you made in an occlusal scan. So, and when you add your buckle and lingual scan, it is very important that uh, you make sure that your buckle and lingual scan has a significant amount of overlap with your occlusal scan as well so that your buccal and lingual scan can be superimposed with a higher accuracy to your initial accurate occlusal scan. So uh, they both are a good way of making a intro scanning and they are known to be very accurate way of making intro scanning. As you can see in this study, if you scan the buccal surface first though, the buccal surface, you don't have a good anatomy. So the superimposition is not very accurate. So you're creating a initial scan with a low accuracy. And then as you scan, um, flash, as you add a flash to that, that inaccurate backbone, you're creating inaccurate final outcomes. So the buckle surface first is probably the worst way that you can, um, you can uh, create an intro scan. So when do I use what, you know, um, most like, I mean, occlusal scan is the easier way of um, scanning, but there are cases that I would prefer using S-type scan, a first anterior teeth, because anterior teeth do not have nice occlusal surface. It just having a little incisal edge. So by doing a little bit of buccal lingual movement when I in, um, scan incisal area, I can make sure that I scan both buccal and lingual surface and um, continue to create nice three-dimensional anatomy rather than just flat surface. Another uh, area that I prefer using S-type scan is the edentulous area. So edentulous area, uh, things are relatively flat. So if I do S-type scan, I can at least have a little bit of uh, like a rich crest anatomy rather than just flat surface. And then if you have a prepared tooth, you know, you don't wanna scan a closed surface of it and come back and add buckle. You wanna make a nice and perfect scan of the critical area and move to a uh, different area. So that's why I use uh, um, S-type scan for the prepared tooth. So this is just an example. I don't know if you can see video very clearly uh, through this webinar, but I'm scanning the occlusal surface first and just go straight. And when I um, go to the anterior area, I change my scan angulation a little bit to a little buccal lingual movement so that I can scan both buccal and lingual surface. And I know I have a, a good three-dimensional anatomy. I know I'm missing here and there, but I don't care about it now. And then as I go to the posterior area, I, go to, I just go straight again. I'm not doing really a buccal lingual movement. Done with the cool scan, then I can go ahead and start scanning the lingual surface. Uh, here is very, very important. As you can see, I'm not scanning like a 90 degree from the lingual side. I'm doing kind of 45 degree lingual scan so that my lingual scan can have a little bit of a closer surface as well. That's what you need um, in order to superimpose your lingual scan to the buccal uh, to the occlusal scan with a higher accuracy. Same with the buccal scan, 45 degree from the buccal side and then you can have a little bit of a closer surface and your buccal surface and just fill out the missing area. You know, total, I don't know, it, it may be about um, two minutes or three minutes, uh, depending on, I, I don't think scanning speed is very important. I mean, it's the impression that nothing is more important than accuracy. So, you know, uh, this was just example. I'm not saying that you have to use this strategy for every single case. This was just example uh, and then, you know, even the S-type scan and a closer surface for these are just examples of a scanning accuracy, a scanning strategy you can use. As long as you uh, uh, follow these two principles, you can be as creative as you want to be with the scanning path. So the principle number one is when you make an initial scan, when you scan certain area for the first time, you have to make a scan through uh, along the surface with complex anatomy. If that is not possible, then you wanna do a little bit of buccolingual movement to get as much as uh, uh, three-dimensional anatomy. So avoid scanning, making an initial scan along the uh, flat or smooth surface. And then when you revisit the area, revisit the area that was scanned initially already and add more scan to it, you can, uh, you can scan along the flat surface, smooth surface, it doesn't matter as long as your scan, revisit scan has good amount of overlap with your initial scan that was made along the good 
and on the surface with the gait anatomy. So as long as you uh, follow these two rules, you can be as creative as you can be with the scanning path. And there are millions of different clinical scenarios that you can use a different clinical uh, scanning path. These are just examples. I'm not telling you to do this or pick one of those three to make your uh, scan. So this is an example of what not to do. So uh, I'm scanning through a closer surface, so so far so good. But as you can see here, as I go to buccal side, uh, my buccal scan does not have a good amount of overlap with my occlusal scan. So now, now I'm trying to merge them together by scanning a little um, area that I missed between the occlusal surface and the buccal surface. As you can already see, if you look at the buccal cusp tip area, those images were not merged together, which is accurate. The occlusion is, occlusion surface is the accurate one, buccal surface was the error. So, and the computer couldn't fix that problem either. So this is not an accurate scan at all. So um, we talked about um, two different things. We talked about how to control the quality of image capture, and that was about how to prepare site uh, before and while scanning um, um, using intro scanner. And we also talked about how to control the quality of superimposition, and that was mainly about um, uh, scanning path. So, you know, when we make an impression, we use the tray and then try and see if there is a big undercut that we need to block out. We kind of do those kind of things routinely, right? So same, same when you make a scan, look at your patient mouth and think about what kind of scanning path you want to use to create a, a um, uh, accurate scan, and I think they'll be very helpful. Uh, what we also talked about is a lot of things that can cause errors, right? So if there are so many things that can cause errors, why would you use intro scanner? Why do you? Why don't we just not use it and then forget about it? Well, the question is, what alternative do we have if we don't use intro scanner? Well, we can just use a conventional impression. And the question is, is it 100% accurate? Is it error-free then? We know it's not error-free either, right? So uh, let's think about this. Um, you know, we talked about um, accuracy of intro scanning being distant dependent. Do you think the accuracy of your previous impression is distant dependent? Uh, what, do we, what do we say when we talk about um, like accuracy of PVS impression. Do we say this PVS impression material has 20 microns of polymerization shrinkage? Do we say something like that? No, we don't say that, right? We say this PVS impression material has a certain percent, percent of shrinkage. So it goes by percentage, which means the longer the impression distance is, the more shrinkage you will have. So accuracy of your PVS impression is also, just like your intro scanning, is also distant dependent then question becomes, which is better or which is worse, right? Keeping this in mind, let's uh, look at this. So when it comes to <clears throat> single tooth restoration, there are numerous, a good numbers of studies, in vitro studies and in vivo studies and systematic review of in vivo and in vitro studies showing that the accuracy of intro scanning can be as good as that of previous impression if you do everything correctly. Um, I can tell you this from my experience and, and then knowledge that I have, you know, if you do everything correctly, single, single tooth restoration will work just fine. Um, so let's make it a little longer than now. Well, now let's talk about single quadrant. When it comes to single quadrant scanning, we still have a good number of scientific evidence showing that the accuracy of the intro scanning can be compatible to that of previous impression and gives you a, a restoration with a clinically acceptable fit if you do everything correctly. So, um, you know, when you work on a single quadrant like a multiple crowns or three any bridges, those are not problem. Intro scanner can be used uh, as long as you use it correctly, used to make a fabricate a restoration with a good fit. So now let's make it even longer. So when it comes to full arch scanning, there are good number of studies, there are a good number of scientific evidence showing that the accuracy of intro scanning is not as good as that of previous impression. So both intro scanning and previous impression, they both are distant dependent, but intro scanning is more distant dependent. So um, 
even if it's a full art case, if I do like crowns here or there, individual crowns, I still can use the intro scanner. But if you're gonna do full art splinted prosthesis, maybe maybe in, um, previous impression can be a more reliable way of making an accurate impression. And uh, I don't I don't think we have to talk about this again, right? This uh, is the worst uh, case that you can use intro scan. I know there are people out there. Uh, claiming that they can use intro scanner for dentures. I know people do that. I've seen people presenting that, but um, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, it's very commonly asked a question. So at the end of the lecture, I get this question almost all the time. So what's, so I, I at some point I included this in the slide. What's the most accurate scanner? It depends on which study you look into. So, you know, different studies say different, scanners are better than the others. But you know, if you look at the difference between um, the accuracy, it's very little, very little. And then I put this five scanners here. I'm not trying to sell anything, but I put those five scanners here because those five, these five scanners are uh, the one that I have a good experience with. And the truth is, truth is, I can tell you that all these are, all of these scanners are good in my opinion. You know, 10, 15, years ago when the scanner just came out, um, the accuracy was about which scanner that you, you get, right? But nowadays, scanner, scanning technology is very advanced. It's very good in my opinion. So it's not about what brand scanner you get. It's more about, you know, what, what brand scanner will you get? It's about preference, at, I think, at this point. I don't think you can make a decision based on accuracy. Well, there are scanners more frequently mentioned than others as a best, a scanner with the best accuracy, but uh, most of the commercially available scanners uh, has a good accuracy. Um, <clears throat> this is my impression, the previous impression that I made. I still make a lot of previous impressions. Um, here, I, I missed a little um, area there. And then, you know, what is this impression material? This is Aquasil. So can I blame Aquasil for this? Um, no, it's not Aquasil's fault. It's, it's my fault. It's so me, right? So the people don't really blame impression material if they miss um, something in their impression, but I've seen a lot of people blaming scanner if they uh, miss something in their skin and saying that this scanner sucks. This doesn't work. But again, with the uh, currently available scanners, I think um, um, it's more about how you how good understanding you have about the way scanner works and also about how you use scanners. So we talked about a lot of things. We talked about a lot of uh, things that we need to think about. So you may think that, oh my God, I have to think about all these different things when I scan, then this is gonna be a too much headache. Well, guess what? If I, have, if I start talking about things that we need to think about when we make a previous impression, I can't even make a longer lecture, right? There are a lot of things we need to think about when we make a previous impression, but once it becomes our habit, we don't really think about it, right? Uh, so there will be a learning curve, and then, uh, but once you are skilled at it, once you are, um, um, once you get used to it, you know, you don't really need to think too much about it. If you just do it, uh, you will you will get it right. So there is a learning curve that you have to go through, but uh, if you uh, as you go through that learning curve, if you think about things that we talked about and try to follow it, I think uh, you will, your learning curve will be a lot shorter and at the end you will be able to make a, a good quality scan. So uh, we talked about the, uh, how to control the quality of uh, your intro scan. So now let's talk a little bit about indications and contraindications. Uh, I don't like talking about this because, you know, I don't, I don't like any type of recipe thing in dentistry. Um, it's hard to, there's no way that I can, you know, list all these clinically possible scenario and then talk about it, but these are just um, my opinions and um, personal recommendation. So first, if you're going to use intro scanner, you need, uh, I think you should use a digital workflow. So for, for example, I had a student that wanted to scan single crown using intro scanner. So I said, yeah, that's, that's great. Let's do it. But by the way, what kind of crown do you want to make? And he wanted to make a PFM. So I said, so do you want a mill metal coping or do you want a 3D print of metal coping? And he goes, he wants to wax and cast metal coping. So are you going to um, wax on top of 3D printed model and cast it? And he said, yeah, can it be done? 
Of course it can be done. Is it a good idea though? <laughs> That's the question, right? So, uh, you know, digital workflow works well if you do everything correctly. Conventional workflow works well if you do everything correctly. If you start mixing them together, you're incorporating more variables. It becomes more hard to control. So I don't like, you know, like a mixing things together. So if you want to use a conventional workflow, I think a previous impression is still will be a better way. So for PFM cases, gold and crown cases, I, I make impressions all the time. I don't use a scanner. So, but if you use Zirconia, EMAXCAD, or um, custom like a milled titanium, um, you know, intro scanning can be a good way to go. Uh, we talked about gingival retraction and saliva control and single tooth restoration will be a perfect case to use an intro scanner. And that include uh, multiple single tooth restorations as well. And uh, short span bridge, there is no rule or uh, there is no scientific evidence of what I'm going to say, but in my mind, uh, up to maybe four unit bridges, I have no problem uh, using intro scanner if it's a um, natural tooth. For implant, um, implant bridges, I use intro scanner up to three unit bridges, not for uh, anything longer than that. And uh, we talked about uh, accuracy of full arch intro scanning not being as accurate as that of previous impression. But if you compare full arch intro scanning accuracy of it to alternate impression, it's, it's at least equal or better than that. So anything that you can do, you would do by using alternate. You can also do that uh, using intro scanner and get the compatible accuracy. Um, the cases that you don't want to use intro scanner is if you want to use a conventional workflow. I think a wax and casting works better with a stone. You know, you're not going to use intro scanning to make gold inlay. I mean, that just doesn't doesn't make sense. And um, deep sum general margin, as we talked about, or it's hard to control bleeding or saliva. The patient has a lot of saliva. It's hard to control. Intro scanner is not the best um, strategy to use. Long span bridge, if they're going to be splinted, probably won't want to use it. I know some people are using intro scanner for removables, but I don't use intro scanner for removables. If the, the tissue moves, it doesn't give you a good superimpositions. So, what do we do if you want to use CAT CAM technology to fabricate restoration, but intro scanner cannot be used? Then you can make an impression and or support the stone model, and you can scan that outside the mouse. It's extra oral scanning. So the way it works is a little different though. So the image capturing principle is the same, but the big difference is the image, uh, first of all, you don't take little pictures. You take a big picture, as you can see here, and then the object is fixed or, or even if it's moving, the movement is basically controlled by the computer precisely. So when you scan it, computer knows where that object is. So for example, if you, if you scan second molar, and then when you put the second molar scan, you don't need to superimpose that to the first molar. Computer knows where the second molar need to go. So when, when extra raw scanner uh, reconstruct this 3D image, it uses internal coordinate system and assign the image to the right spot. It doesn't superimpose anything. So there is no superimposition involved when 3D image is reconstructed. And that makes huge difference, actually. So if you think about it, what was the problem that we had because of superimposition? Uh, first, because of superimposition, the accuracy of intro scanning was dependent on surface morphology, right? We do not have that problem with the extra scanning. It doesn't matter what kind of surface it is, you can scan um, just fine. And another problem that we had with us um, because of the superimposition was distant dependency, right? So, uh, and we don't have that problem with extra oral scanning. So you, it, regardless of the scanning distance, extra oral scan can maintain a similar accuracy. Problem is though, um, then why do we not use this all the time then? The problem is now the accuracy of your impression comes into play. So, um, when if you talk about the accuracy of indirect digitization which is a combination of your impression and sometimes stone model plus extra oral scanning then the uh, end result is still distant dependent not because extra oral scanning is distant dependent but because your impression still is distant dependent but it is a lot less distant dependent than intro scanning 
So if you look at the accuracy, up to quadrant scan, the accuracy is compatible. So whether it's a single unit or quadrant scan, then uh, extra, uh, indirect digitization and direct digitization has a compatible accuracy. But when it comes to full arch scan, and as discussed already, extra oral scanning uh, uh, in, with a uh, previous impression can give you more reliable uh, impressions. So this is a better, uh, better way to go when you come to full arch uh, scanning. All right, so let's look at some clinical examples to think about whether we're going to use a scanner or not. So here we have a three unique case, one veneer, one crown, one veneer. Um, you know, typical uh, quadrant dentistry that we do, this is a perfect example to me to use intro scanner. Uh, crown margin number eight, slightly subgingival, but um, I think I can, uh, that's not too deep, so I can take care of that. So make, I made an intro scanning, designed it, and milled uh, lithium desilicate, and then when uh, the lithium desilicate come out of the milling machine, you can have the overall contour as you want, but you don't really have nice anatomies and detailed contour. So you kind of have to manually contour that and then uh, crystallization and staining all that. Then you have the, this, uh, um, this patient did um, ortho treatment. I'm, I'm not showing the whole story, but this patient went through ortho and some gingival surgeries as well. So wanted to make sure that uh, restoration is strong. So, but if you want to make it prettier, then you can also layer ceramic and incisolacy as well. How about this case? We have 10 crowns. This is a student case that we did on Mercat. Uh, we have 10 crowns, but I'm going to make a 10 individual crowns, so they will not be splinted. If these are going to be individual, you know, when, when I see this crown, I want to have a nice marginal fit, and I want to have a nice proximal contact with this guy, but I don't really care about this area, though. So, you know, if this is going to be splinted, I care about the accuracy between this crown and this crown, if I'm going to splint them. But if, if this is going to be 10 individual unit, I care about the local accuracy, but I don't care too much about the accuracy between this guy and this guy. So I have no problem making intro scan in a case like this. So we made an intro scan, and then uh, this is, again, the Emax CAD crowns, and we delivered uh, with a very minor uh, adjustment the day of delivery. Uh, how about this case here? This patient wanted to have a night guard, and then so I will have to make a full art scan, uh, which is not as accurate as previous impression. But uh, what, do, what do you use to make a night guard? I use Osnate all the time, and it works fine for me. So uh, if I can use Osnate for it, I can use intro scan too. So I made an intro scan, and the anterior jig is to first to pay, guide patient Joe to CR, second, to make a bite scan there so that I don't have to open this up on a virtual articulator, which can cause a little bit of error. So uh, intro scan is mounted at that vertical dimension. Without changing vertical dimension, the night card can be designed and milled and delivered with a minor, uh, very little adjustment. Everything was fitting just fine. How about this here that I'm making denture? You know, uh, can I make scan of this? I feel very, I feel confident making scan. I mean, I can make a good looking image out of this. It's not about whether you can do it or not. It's not about what kind of accuracy you get from it. So, and you know, you, it's, to me, this is no brainer. Just going to make a conventional impression. Another reason is look at this here, you know, uh, border, right? Border molding. Uh, so we have a border molding, nicely molded border there. And this is, exactly transferred to the denture base there. Um, there's no way you can do this with intro scanner. I, I've seen people saying that they, they are doing bottom molding with intro scanner. So what they do is they retract the lip like a crazy and try to capture border with the scanner. Um, that's torture to the patient, first of all. And then capturing border, capturing uh, vestibule is different from doing bottom molding, you know? You have to do puckered and smiles and open and close and all that. There's no way that you can do that with your intro scanner. So most of the protocol out there when you make a digital denture is to make an impression and scan that outside of mouth. How about this case here? Uh, so I'm doing implant assisted RPD, a lot of soft tissues there, a lot of soft tissues that I'm impressing. And I'm always going to make a PFM for those. So to me, this is a, a, a better way to go is to make a conventional impression than, uh, than make an intro scan. Um, so RPD case, um, this one here, I was going to make a three unit bridge there. I have no problem doing that with intro scanner. 
uh, single crown, no problem, single crown, no problem, single implant, no problem. That's the only thing that I would, that makes me hesitate a little bit. I don't think it's impossible though with, uh, with uh, 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 if you're skilled at scanning, you know, those teeth are moving. So you gotta be careful not to capture that when you cross this area. But uh, if you're skilled, you may be able to do this. But the main reason that I want to use a PBS impression is to see what I'm making. I'm making PFM. So, you know, um, stone and impression works better with a PFM, in my opinion. So uh, we wanted, I went ahead and make a, just a regular conventional impression for this case. Uh, three unit implant case. And then the inter implant distance is a little far, a uh, little um, big because the, the panic was going to be a first molar, but up to three unit, I've been doing this and it's been okay. It, it works pretty well in my opinion, if you're skilled. So um, three unit bridge case, uh, these are custom abutment and then and the monolithic, the so-called a uh, screw mentable type of uh, uh, restoration here. Uh, how about this case? So I was going to do crown there, two single crown. So I was going to do a five unit implant bridge there and three unit bridge there. Um, so if you just think about it, I think the better way, five implants, a long span, the better way would be using PBS impression. For now, the most accurate implant impression technique, I'm not talking too much about implant scanning today, but the most Im accurate implant scanning technique is um, open tray splinted. So um, intro scanning is, the accuracy of intro scanning is maybe compatible to that of a closed tray technique, I think. So the better way would be making PVS impression, but uh, first I wanted to make a provisional restoration. So uh, I just tried the intro scanning because it's, you know, it's a provisional. So I made an intro scanning and we designed the provisional. I'm not splinting all the way, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting right there. So, um, um, made an intro scan and then made a provisional restoration and, and things fit uh, nicely. When it comes to final impression though, I made a, a, a custom impression copying and traditional pickup splinted PBS impression technique for final restoration because, you know, like I said, you know, this fit okay when I delivered it, like how to, up to what micron can you really feel it when you deliver, right? So. I don't think I can really have an evaluation about the fit when I deliver it. So based on the currently available scientific literature, the best way is to pick up splint, uh, to make a pickup splint impression. And then um, the, the prosthesis is ready for delivery. This is one of this uh, Corona case that I was sitting in my lab for a long time um, because of the coronavirus that I couldn't deliver this yet, but I, I hope I will be able to soon. Uh, full arch splinted, right? So we had one implant placed long already. I thought I placed a former implant doing full arch restoration. This is a typical case that I would use a PVS impression rather than, uh, I'm not saying it's impossible to scan. If you scan it, you try it, it may fit okay. But uh, is it most predictable way of doing that? Then um, probably not. So I open tray pickup impression, I think still is the most predictable way if it's a long span a splinted prosthesis, so um, the fit was fine. These are just examples of other indication that the infrared scanner can be convenient. So a uh, patient with a gag reflex, hypersensitivity, especially if you're gonna mix osmate with a cold water, a patient with a mouth, limited mouth opening, ortho patient, infrared scanning makes impression so much easier. Um, severe, a uh, patient with a severe undercut on any other condition that makes impression difficult. Looking at the example here, this patient, uh, I know this mouth doesn't look very small, but her she was very tiny lady, so she her face was very small, so this was extremely small mouth. And then a patient has a scleroderma, so this connective tissue disease, so she, her lips had a zero elasticity. I couldn't retract her lip at all. So what oral surgeon did to get her teeth extracted was oral surgeon made a releasing incision there. And then uh, um, when she came first came to see me, uh, she still had a suture on, on, on the, her mouth, um, corner of her mouth. Uh, and then I saw her one month after extraction, then she had a bone exposure everywhere. So healing was not normal either. I had to wait for a year just to have those bones covered with a mucosa. So implant was not an uh, option from the beginning. So I was thinking about, you know, 
uh, how, how to make a denture for a patient because the normal size denture will not fit in there. So uh, I was thinking about making like two piece dentures or dentures that you can fold. I was trying to be creative, but the problem was her hands were affected too. So I couldn't really, uh, the only solution that I could come up with is, was to make some kind of mini denture that she can put, it, um, put in her mouth through this small mouth opening. Well, the question is now, how do I make a preliminary impression, which is a first step of making complete denture. So I went to the pedo clinic and then, hey, get me the smallest tray you have. And I tried this here. And as you can see, I couldn't even get the half of the tray in. So how do I make an impression? Uh, I scanned it. Is that accurate? No. And what else? I don't have a bottom warning at all, right? So I cannot make a denture on top of it, but this is my preliminary impression. So I made a custom tray on it. And then at the day of impression, I cut custom tray until I was able to put that tray in her mouth through that tiny opening and then made an impression. You may think I'm missing all this posterior area, but yeah, I am missing those posterior area, but there's no point of impressing this area because if I cover, if my denture cover this area, patient will not be able to put this in her mouth. So I made this mini denture and then somehow I delivered it. This was a challenging case, but um, you know, somehow I made it work. So uh, we talked about the, uh, also some indications and contraindication. And I think uh, I cannot really tell you who, whether you have to use this central scanner or not for every single case scenario based on things that we've been discussing so far, I think you should be able to make a decision as a clinician. So um, I'm done with my lecture part. So uh, now I'm gonna be sharing some of the uh, cases that uh, we did here, here at Marquette University uh, using intro scanner. So um, I will show two of uh, my student cases and I'll show my own, one of my own cases as well. So, um, you know, the conventional typical workflow, we're talking about scanning, which is uh, uh, the uh, part of data acquisition. And then also uh, CAD and CAM, I'm sure you all have a good understanding about it. So uh, let's look at the cases here. The first case was done by our D4 student, Kelsey. This is a young female patient came to us looking for an aesthetic improvement. Uh, number nine was the single crown, uh, single provisional crown that she had and she didn't like it as she wanted to improve overall aesthetics. So looking at her smile, so I thought that probably we can um, uh, reposition gingival margins and incise the lattices a little bit to, to create a nice smile that she wanted to have. So what we're doing here is first you make a, a initial diagnostic scan and take some facial photos and by selecting some reference pointers, you can merge them together. And the point of doing that is as you design now, as they are married to each other, as you design your restoration on your intraoral skin, you can actually see how that will look like an impatient photo as well. So once you are happy with the design, we, uh, by tracing the gingival margin of the uh, design that we made on six, seven, eight, we made this uh, design, this crown lengthening guide and have this uh, 3D printed. And uh, our superior resident, Jeff Garcia, uh, use this crown lengthening guide as a, a reference that she did a little crown length. We didn't do too much because we didn't want to expose the CEJ to have a nice bonding for veneers. And after three months of healing, patient came back with an improved gingival margin. So um, you see this, this is not really a packed lateral, but it's a small lateral incisor. We have rotations and gaps here and there. So we have to uh, play with the proportions and width of the tooth a little bit. So student did a diagnostic wax up. The wax up is not perfect, but you know, for D4 student to do this kind of wax up, I had to send her back 20 times, but uh, she did a, a nice work. And then, you know, again, the preparation is not perfect either, but this is her first veneer preparation. So considering that, I think this is excellent. And then uh, we made an intro scan with a single core technique because the, the margin was not too deep. So most of the finish lines were exposed uh, by just placing single cord and then um, you know take a straight picture as we normally do. And uh, one of the challenges for me was to match shade of number eight and nine. We'll discuss that later. And then typical uh, spot etching technique to provisionalize uh, the veneer. So, um, 
you know, I, I, uh, I do a lot of lab work. So when I was trained at the University of Washington, uh, we had to do a lot of lab work. And since then, I've been kept doing lab work. So I would say I do lab work for about 50% of my cases, especially anterior cases. And then if I like student cases, I do lab work for my student as well. So this is one of the cases that I did uh, lab work for my student case. Um, normally I would do the smell design again, but this I had a nicely done wax up already. So what I'm doing is I scan my wax up, I'm, I'm student wax up as well, and merge them together and use that as a guidance for my um, uh, virtual design that makes design a lot easier. And then uh, send this design uh, milling, um, um, Position this in your CAD block and then uh, use the lithium disilicate to mill the veneers. And then in uh, this case, I did a little bit of cutback. The veneer was very thin, so I didn't have a room to do a lot of cutback. So very, very minimal cutback right at the inside lats and then letting a little porcelain and finish the veneer. Again, the challenge was, uh, you, you can see the eight and nine stem shade is a little different. The challenge was to match the shade here, but I was able to uh, make a I think the proportion is 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 not bad. You know the gingival uh, surgery that we do work well, and then uh, patient. This is after two weeks after delivery. Um, soft tissue looks great to me, and the patient uh, was really uh, very very happy with the final outcome. And I don't know. I wasn't able to do this when I was a dental student, so I think uh, uh, my student did a great job, and patient was happy as well. Second case done by Steph Miller. Uh, she's D4 now, but she, she did this case when she was D3. So we have this another young female patient had a lot of wear on the lingual side, as you can see, and this is mainly acid erosion. She had acid erosion on the lingual side, six to 11. She also had a little acid erosion on the buccal side as well. You'll see it later. Um, and also, you know, when you have acid erosion, you do have a, um, your enamel becomes a little softer. So even normal function can cause a significant amount of wear. So this is basically a combination of uh, acid erosion and attrition, but uh, the, the, the acid erosion was the problem. The teeth were short, and then you can see the patient had the alto passive eruption as well. And then this was, uh, um, aesthetically, this was a problem. And she was starting to have a little sensitivity because of the lingual dentin exposure. So, um, you know, wanted to make tooth longer. There are two different ways of doing that, or you can be somewhere in the middle as well. So you're looking at the face and the patient occlusion. You can see here a little excessive gingival display, a smile, and then occlusion, she has a deep bite. So I think we all can agree that a little bit of crown lengthening can be beneficial for this patient. So that's what we planned. Um, so same thing, make a diagnostic intraoral scan and take facial photos and merge them together and design tools in a way that I like to have at the end. And then once we're done with the design, then um, make a crown lengthening guys by tracing the gingival margin of our future restoration and then have that 3D printed. And then our perio resident, Kinan Arvitar, um, did a nice crown lengthening surgery. It didn't take very long with this uh, nicely made guide. And then we wait for healing. And three months after, a patient came back with an improved uh, gingival margin. And to precisely um, design the provisional, again, we took facial photos again, and then we're design designing her provisional restoration now. So, and you know, this is the cross section of number nine, and that the black line here, this is how her tooth contour looks like now, and this yellow one is the contour of my design. So if you look at it, um, um, you look at the buccal side here, the uh, gingival half uh, is, is, uh, shows you how the normal contour was before the acid erosion because this was under the gingival before crown lengthening. So this part was not affected by acid, er uh, acid erosion. And inside the half, uh, was affected by acid erosion and she lost a significant amount of enamel there. So my goal was to, to restore tooth contour to its normal shape. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to extend the gingival third contour all the way to the inside left on the facial side. On the lingual side, you know, patient does have a wear pattern that clearly show you where that envelope function is. So I didn't want to uh, change that contour too much. So this uh, area that, that uh, her mandibular incisors are interacting, I'm just copying it. But um, um, uh, more incisively, the, the mandibular, uh, her, her, 
her mandible doesn't really go there. So I actually lengthened the inside of the a little bit. This is a very unique situation because normally it would be the other way around. So the incisal half is a functionally critical area and lingual half, uh, gingival half is functionally non-critical area for a class one patient. But this is a very unique situation you're having because, uh, because she is a class two. Uh, she has a class two occlusal relationship. So, um, and also, I was, uh, I was looking at this wear pattern here. You can see the patient has a significant amount of attrition on the lingual cusp of the premolars. So you may think this is from groove function because she's a class two, but if this was from groove function, the typical location of the wear that you will see is the lingual inclination of a buccal cusp tip. But as you can see here, the wear pattern, the wear facet is on the buccal inclination of lingual cusp tip, which means this can be a potentially uh, non-working site interference. So I mounted my intro scanning on the articulator and trying to move my, uh, her jaw around to see uh, where the wear facet is coming from. And you can clearly see that um, is actually a non-working site interference. So I wanted to relieve that. So I basically um, designed the lingual surface of the restoration by just copying existing contour, by adding a little bit of contour on the distal of the canine to make canine guidance slightly steeper to relieve the inner uh, um, uh, non-working site interference. So you look at the lingual anatomy, it's ugly. There is no uh, you know, anatomy, but, um, and that was because this was basically designed by copying the existing contour and I got rid of the uh, non-working site interference. So once the design is done, I do this uh, virtual tooth preparation um, and then by overlapping the design to that, and I was able to create this shell temporary 0.5 millimeter is the thickness that I like. And we created this 0.5 millimeter shell temporary and um, it's all splinted one piece as it's temporary. And then we mill it using high density PMMA and have it ready. So, you know, this is 0.5 millimeters. So if we're gonna do more than 0.5 millimeter reduction, we should be able to see it with no uh, problem. And then we also created a 3D printed model of the design and then made a putty matrix for intro mockup and also pull down matrix for a reduction guys. So, uh, you know, why do you do this? Because, because you did a digital smile design again. So digital smile design at the end is a two dimensional evaluation. So uh, especially when you make a significant change in a buccal lingual inclination, three dimensional evaluation will give you a better idea. So we did intro mockup first to make sure the patient is happy with that. And uh, she was so, uh, we're going to cut 6 to 11 preparation. It's, it's nothing to you, it's nothing to me, but uh, for D3 student, cutting six to in one day is a big deal. So I had her practice on a stone cast and I'm showing three, but she did more. So, and then uh, the last stone preparation that she did was great. And then I think uh, she was ready. So we went ahead and then prepared a six to from six to 11 in the same day. And the image there showed you how we're using this uh, preparation guide to make a uh, perfect reduction. And then we made an intro scan of our preparation, upper and lower arch scan. We use a three-shaped trios for this case. And this um, provisional shell was relined using regular PMMA acrylic regions. I think uh, we, we could have the open up the embrasure a little more, but you know, for D3, I mean, she did a great job. Uh, and then, uh, this blue scan here is the design that I made for her provisional. I'm using this design without altering it because she was happy with the mock-up. If she didn't like it, what I could have done is I could make a little adjustment on her mock-up and then scan it again, then uh, I can use that as a design guide. But anyway, um, so I did this design and then, uh, and then the lingual side, I mean, she's class two, but I had to make a little adjustment to make occlusion perfect. And we have a six individual crown designed and sent to the milling machine. And we got this milled using a Emacs cat and the little inside the last cutback. This time I was able to do a little more cutback because the crown has a little more, um, uh, we did a little more reduction of her crown and then layering uh, ceramics and then do ceramic work. I normally do this on a Saturday. So this was another Saturday working in the lab. And I had the final restoration uh, ready for a delivery. And I think in terms of tooth proportion, I think we achieved what we planned uh, when we first did a crown lengthening. 
the, uh, this was two weeks. I saw her after four weeks again, and we got a little black triangle in the middle field after another two weeks, but don't have photo. But uh, I think uh, uh, for D3 student case, this is excellent outcome, and patient was ha very happy uh, with the final outcome. All right. I don't know, you know, I, I, I couldn't even think about doing this when I was D4 student, so. Um, I don't know these days. <laughs> um, all right, so this is the last case that I'm presenting. This is my case, and um, believe it or not, I I know how to dentist, how to do dentistry too. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, whenever I have chance, I try to show my student case because I mean, it's it's not surprising that I do this, but I'm I'm it's it's very surprising or exciting that that my students D three D four students are doing this. So. Um, but anyway, uh, this is my patient. So what happened to her was uh, um, she had a Sjogren syndrome, so dry mouth, of course, and then she had a lot of acid erosion here and there. Her saliva buffering function was not working properly, so mouth was basically acidic. So she's got this composite veneer somewhere. So this is a direct composite veneer she has for lower incisors and uh, upper canine to canine. And you can see how thin this enamel is. And then lingually, she doesn't have anything. So she was having very sens bad sensitivity, both upper and lower incisors. So uh, her main concern was not aesthetic. She, she really wanted to get rid of the sensitivity. That's why she came to me. Um, uh, and then you're looking at her occlusion. You can clearly see she has an open bite. She did have a good occlusive contact on molar and second premolar, but from first premolar to first premolar, she did have an open bite. So as a result, as you, if you can see how her jaw moves, all this uh, movement is being guided by second molar. Uh, there is no anterior guidance for her. So looking at the lingual side, I mean, this is our attrition. She has open bite. Their, her teeth, upper and lower teeth are not touching each other, but she lost all the enamel, have a dentin exposure here and there. And um, uh, the lower incisors were the most sensitive tooths. So, and looking at the x-rays, everything is normal. So, you know, um, I thought maybe if I just cover that uh, exposed dentin, I probably can uh, get rid of sensitivity. So um, looking at the symptoms and amount of tooth loss, uh, you know, the, from first molar to first premolar, you look at the first premolar here, it looks almost looks like somebody was doing a very uh, conservative crown preparation there, right? So that's acid erosion as well. So, and then you may think that she didn't lose a lot of tooth structure on the facial side, but this was covered with a composite, but she kind of had a dentins everywhere uh, after removing the composite. So, um, I decided to do crowns from first premolar to first premolar because they, those are the areas that has more symptoms and more tooth stamines. Uh, first uh, molars and second premolar, I thought I just could do a little composite resin and then fluoride therapy. Uh, so that was the treatment plan set. Um, so I start by designing my maxilla. And then as we all know, the way, as we design maxillary teeth, probably the most important thing you need to look at is the uh, aesthetic. So, um, Normally, if you're gonna just do 6 to 11, I just do the small photo, but if you're gonna extend a little more to the back, the retracted view can help in terms of leveling occlusive plane on the left and right side. So um, again, photos and intro scan merge them together and then design those teeth in a way that I can restore uh, aesthetically pleasing smile. My goal was to, she has a very nice lip line, I think. So my goal was to follow this lip line um, to create a nice smile. And um, so as in order to do that, you can see that I had to lengthen her incisal lattice a little bit. And I still thought that the, uh, the individual tooth proportion was within uh, acceptable range. So once we're done with upper design, now we go ahead and start um, designing mandible. And then when I design mandible, I think um, the, the thing that I paid more attention was occlusion, the function. So the mandibular teeth were designed in a way that I can create a close skin that I want. I wanted to close an open bite and create a very shallow canine guidance and anterior guidance as well. So that's how the mandibular teeth were um, designed. So as we uh, are making a significant difference in terms of tooth length and contour, it's very important that we prepare tooth based on uh, our future design. And also the patient need to be provisionalized 
uh, by following my future restoration design in order to have a have a, a ability to test the new occlusal scheme that I'm giving to her. So uh, based on that, I made a shell provisional restoration as I showed you before and milled out of using high density PMMA and also printed a 3D model and make a pull down matrix to use that as a reduction guide. And the teeth were prepared, upper and lower uh, uh, prep and then intraoral scan was made as you can see. And then uh, the shell provision was relined by using regular PMMA um, restoration. And then I was able to establish the occlusal scheme that I planned for her. And then, um, well, this is, you know, first time that she's having anterior guidance in her life. So I wanted to test this for a while if she feels comfortable with this and she was doing just fine. She actually called me yes, uh, next day and then telling me that she could drink water because she said she couldn't drink water without straw because the front teeth were so sensitive but now she, even with the provisional she could drink water so we just uh, copied the uh, design that i did for provisional restoration and have all these crowns milled and then um this time you know i was creating anterior guidance for the patient who used to function with an uh, open bite so i'm making my anterior guidance steeper so I wanted to make sure that I have a strong incisolates. So I didn't uh, layer ceramic and incisolates. I just went for a monolithic restoration without layering. So in a typical uh, um, surface treatment for ceramic bonding, and then we delivered a, a crowns and then a little composite restoration. And as you can see, I created an anterior guidance. It's very shallow, as you can see. I didn't want to make it too stiff because patient is used to uh, functioning under open bite, but I did create posterior disclusion with a very shallow canine guidance. Patient was very happy with the final outcome, and of course, all the sensitivity uh, was gone. As you can see, the final outcome looks very similar to what I designed when I uh, did um, digital smile design. So uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, these are the people who uh, work with me all the time together. So uh, like to. Uh, some of the credit need to go to all those people. And then um, one more, one last thing that I want to show is this is the project that I've been working very hard for the last three years. I was hired by Marquette University uh, right after graduating from the University of Washington graduate prosthetics. Um, and then well, they had a specific mission to me. They were hiring me to create this digital dentistry curriculum. So there was zero digital dentistry curriculum at that time. So Marquette was ready to make investment. Uh, so I, uh, uh, I and uh, my department chair, Gary, Gary Stafford, we worked really hard on this project. So I think now uh, we started this digital dance course two years ago. Now I think uh, uh, my digital dance course is, uh, is probably one of the strongest, I think. Um, and um, uh, we're getting a very good review. It's not easy. Uh, um, you know, enjoyable course. We, it's a stressful, it's an intense course, and we have students uh, crying almost every week under, because of the stress. You know, I, I know a lot of people think that digital dentistry, so you just have to push the button, then computer will do everything. It, it, it really is not like that. There is a, a very uh, intense learning curve that you have to go through, but at the end, I think is, is uh, uh, I think my students are uh, uh, being benefited by, by this. All right, with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank um, you. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have some questions. I thought we could bang through these. Uh, sure. Uh, how are you doing time-wise? You okay there? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, the question about Invisalign, are the Invisalign uh, scans accurate? Accurate enough for orthodontic purpose. Um, Invisalign, normally the scan will be made using iTero scanner because the Invisalign um, doesn't communicate with other scanners. But so, you know, how accurate are we for orthodontic treatment? Are we looking at microns of accuracy? You know, again, if it is, um, if it is good enough, if you use alternate, you can use an scanner. I, I normally think that way. So. Uh, iter using iTero for Invisalign, as long as you do every, everything correctly, I think that works uh, just fine. 
Okay. Uh, for those of you that have questions, uh, please, uh, you can take a look at what questions are in the Q&A feature right now. If there's something that you're really interested in, upvote that and it'll move it to the top. Uh, is your preference video versus individual pictures in intraoral scanners? Yeah, again, it's not different. It's the same thing. It's just different way of advertising. Video is a, a multiple images, right? So the basic way, um, uh, basic, the principle is not different. So the, the uh, scanners that are claiming that they're taking continuous video, I believe the 3M true definition and also uh, Surrey Omnicam, um, you know, how many pictures do you need to take per second to claim that it's a video? Is that there's no like number set, mm -hmm. but um, for example, Trios takes 10 per second. So they say they're taking multiple images. And then uh, 3M takes 20 per second. So they say they are taking video. So, and also, um, you know, when it comes to the number of images you're taking, it also has to something to do with a, a, a tip size. If the tip size is a small, individual image captures are very small, then you have to take more pictures per second to compensate that because you have to uh, superimpose more number of images. So, um, uh, I don't think that's the important factor that you have to consider is it can be slightly different image capturing technologies, but at the end, the way it works is not that different. Okay. When making a scan of multiple restorations in a single quadrant, are you introducing more air by scanning the contralateral side in order to get a more accurate uh, clusal bite? Yeah, bite is one of the things that, um, you know, scanning accuracy is very predictable, I think. Bite accuracy is a little less predictable. So, you know, um, but um, single, two, maybe th up to three in it, I think quadrant scan works just fine. But it is, it is true that if you uh, scan the other side and make a bite from both sides, and if you, your, the other side bite scan is not completely accurate, that can actually introduce more errors as well. But um, it also is good that because now you can do excursive movement and then create a closer scheme that you want. So if your number of unit is larger, then uh, you know, no matter what, even if you make a previous impression, we make a closer adjustment when we deliver restoration anyway, right? So mm -hmm. I don't particularly, I don't think that the amount of occlusion just one that I make when I use the scanner is more than um, that of, you know, the, the crown made in a conventional workflow. So I, um, if, if it is more than three in it, I normally make a full arch scan. And then uh, when you make a bite scan, try not to include too much soft tissue, especially the movable part of the tissue that can create um, errors. And also try to make bite scan a little, 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 little longer rather than just capturing like a one or two tip. That's the tip that I can give you. Okay, somebody's intent on doing uh, intraoral scanning for uh, dentures here. And they ask, can I put multiple markers made of acrylic on the end? It, dentulous ridges and try to capture the intraoral image? And can I utilize the intraoral scan data to fabricate complete dentures? Yeah, so again, uh, markers can help. There are studies that people are doing putting markers because the, the point of putting markers on the dentulous area is creating some anatomy on the dentulous area. So like uh, they put a little like a markers to, and then there are some studies showing that the scanning accuracy can actually be increased. So, but, you know, practically thinking about it, what do you think is more work? Just making an impression versus putting all the markers and trying to scan all that, right? Plus, even if, if it's a complete entry, even if you put marker, how are you going to do bowl morning? How are you going to do pucker and smile and open and close all that, right? So, um, I'm not saying that's wrong. That also can be done um, successfully, I think. But my preference is for denture, I just use impression. Okay. Does burr coarseness influence scanning accuracy in natural tooth preparations? Um, I wouldn't think so. But I haven't seen any studies talking about it. Um, so I don't. I, I don't think I can answer the question. No, uh, not, I, I wouldn't I, think so. 
Yeah. I recently did a lit search on that and I couldn't find anything either. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I use an iTero scanner for single units mostly and we mail them in office. For implant case, what kind of implant transfer do you need in order to take a scan and send it to the laboratory? So you need a scan body of them. You cannot directly scan the implant. So you need to have a scan body is equivalent of impression coping. So uh, for example, if you have a trauma implant, you can order scan body from trauma. If you have a Nobel implant, you can order scan body from Nobel. And there are some third party scan bodies as well. So you would um, ask, talk to your lab about what, and then it's, they have to, in software, they have to have that um, implant scan body in their library. So you can ask your lab what kind of scan body they have in their libraries and then order the scan body and scan that instead of uh, scanning implant. The scanning technique is not very different from normal, normal scanning. Okay. If full arch scans are less accurate, would you recommend taking a traditional PVS impression, then scanning it extraorally in order to plan implants when merging with cone beam CT, et cetera? Yeah, um, merging with the cone beam CT, I think we're talking about planning stage here, right? Yes. So then the purpose of doing that would be to make a surgical guide, right? So right. we're not talking about microns here, right? <laughs> so I normally use the intro scanner for that. The surgical guide fits just fine. Uh, maybe it's a few micron less accurate than PBS impression, maybe, but uh, I don't think that influence, you know, the accuracy of implant surgery, we're talking about, you know, we're happy for maybe within a millimeter or 0.5 millimeters, something like that, right? So uh, a few micron wouldn't affect. So uh, surgical guy, I use in intro scanning all the time, uh, no problem. Okay. Considering that your last denture was fabricated with some degree of inaccuracy, did the denture need adjustment? Uh, which? I think that my, must be that uh, last uh, patient with the very small mouth. Oh, so the uh, intro scan was made to create a preliminary impression. The final impression was made using PVS that I, I made a custom tray using uh, the 3D model printed. So um, I don't think the accuracy would be uh, different from typical denture that we make from PVS impression. But adjustment is needed anyway. <laughs> no matter how accurate things are, adjustment is needed when you deliver, especially denture, uh, almost all the time. So yeah, I made a little bit of adjustment. Hey, uh, do you offer an intraoral scanning hands-on course? Um, only if you're a student of Marquette University. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd say that. Uh, we might have to bring you out to Seattle sometime and uh, do a program for us at the Washington. Sounds uh, great. Yeah. yeah the Sounds Master great. Track program. I, I know we could put that together. Would love yeah, to. Yeah, my wife is trying to, trying really hard to find an excuse to visit Seattle. So <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get Dr. Jason Kim to come and visit uh, as well. Okay. Uh, Somebody asked, would you please bring the pick of the steps for bonding? Uh, did, did you have pictures of the bonding steps there? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. Thank you for doing that. Sure. What measurement is clinically acceptable when scanning porcelain slash gold versus natural teeth? I'm sorry. I didn't get the question. Can you... Yeah, I think what they're asking is uh, what's, uh, what's clinically acceptable errors with scanning technology? Um, well, so if, if you're asking about this uh, different uh, uh, scanning uh, uh, accuracy of different surface, right? So uh, they concluded in that study, they concluded that the error, amount of error that you're getting by scanning uh, shiny glazed or polished ceramic uh, was clinically acceptable, and then the the criteria they used was it was a less than twenty five micron. Okay. Yeah. So that's something that we can accept when we make you know crowns or. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, with deep subgingival finish lines, will you not do crown lengthening surgery before seeding crown? I think they're talking about uh, 
your original images with the, the very deep margins there? Yeah, so um, that, um, well, if, if, it, if it is invading biologic width, the crown lengthening might be needed, but um, it, was, it was not. And then um, they had another, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, the gingival was healthy, although uh, the crown was very deep soft gingival. I, I remember that was like, I was redoing crown for the pre existing PFN crown, which was prepared deep already. Um, so, and gingival was healthy and it was not invading by allergic width, but uh, if you wanted to reduce the pocket depth, which I still think was normal. It was, pocket depth itself was not that deep. So it was challenging, but I didn't think it was necessary to cut um, gingival away. Uh, the question regarding, I, uh, on milled restorations, I'll paraphrase here, that uh, the uh, cement spacing, the internal relief, uh, and how those parameters are set up in the software. How, how do you determine uh, what uh, spacing you're going to use? On yeah, um, I mean, I, I've tried the different values. The value that I like to use is 50 micron now. So, um, and then I'm sure now we all, are, you all are familiar with the concept of drill compensation. So, yeah, so yeah. Um, on, if you ha have any sharp area in your preparation, you're, you know, so, CAD CAM software tend to give a little excessive um, uh, cement space to, to make it millable. So, um, but, uh, so the preparation need to be more, I think is more technique sensitive. If you, your preparation is not nice, then you're gonna have a lot of a big internal space for restoration. But, um, you know, I, I don't, cause you know, um, Let's say that I, I said 50 micron, then do I really get 50 micron? That's another question, right? So uh, I've done like, uh, I started with like 80 because that was recommended by my lab technician first. I thought it's a little loose. So I was reducing a little by a little. And then at 30, I was feeling like it's not fully sitting. So uh, the value that I like using is 50. For veneer, maybe I can use like 40s. Okay, there's uh, three questions here. Just asking, have you looked at the prime scan? Have you looked at the Medit I-500 and uh, also the CareStream scanners? Yeah, so the prime scan, I think is from the uh, Denseplay, right? Yeah, so, Denseplay yeah. Serona, yeah. Yeah, prime scan and the Medit is also uh, like a relatively uh, new scanners. Uh, I don't have it, so because um, I'm, I'm working for dental school, I have this luxury of having different types of scanners. So the the scanners that I'm uh, very familiar with is Planmeca, Three Shave, Three M, and Itero. The other scanners I've tried a couple times, but I don't really know enough to talk about it. But you know, the those are companies with a good reputation, so I would assume that their scanners will be pretty good. But I never tried it, so I can't really talk about it. Uh, a person was doing a four-unit zirconia bridge. They asked their lab for a 3D printed occlusal index to verify the digital scan ac accuracy. Lab said it's pointless because 3D printing has significant margin of error. Is there a way to verify accuracy of scan for large prosthetic cases other than making a uh, polyvinyl siloxane impression? Uh, well, 3D printing can give you an idea about uh, accuracy, if whether it's grossly off or not, I think. If it's grossly off, you will see that. But uh, let's say that, you know, when you compare the, like for example, this is a common dilemma that I have. Like when I, when I work on multiple unit, I have this 3D printing model and I have this, my milled ceramic, and then the contact is high. Do I adjust it or not? If I adjust it, I'm trusting 3D printing more than milling, right? And if I don't adjust it, you know, somehow I feel very uncomfortable. So, um, you know, how accurate 3D printing, uh, is it 3D printing? If everything is done very accurately, the literature shows that it has a accuracy compatible to, to conventional casts. So, 
but if it's a full arch, I'm not sure. So, well, the best way to figure that out is to make a final restriction and then <laughs> try to deliver. But I think um, 3D printing can be one of the ways. It wouldn't tell you like under like a few microns of error, but it will tell you whether it's grossly off or not. Okay, uh, question regarding byte registrations. Uh, when do you opt to use uh, a byte jig, such as a Lucia jig, to get the byte registration? And when is MIP acceptable? MIP is acceptable for most cases. I was, uh, I was making, the only cases that you would use a CR is either you were doing full mouth rehabilitation or some kind of full arch prosthesis, like dentures or full arch, prosthesis, then you don't have MIP because you're cutting everything. So um, I think it's a little off topic, but the reason that I was using Lucia Zip was that I was making night guard, which is kind of full arch prosthesis. So, and also another reason is that, you know, if you just make an MIP, and I think it is acceptable to make night guard at MIP and just increase the pin on the articulator a little bit. And then when you deliver, you have to make a little adjustment anyway. Um, but the reason that I did the Lucia Zip was that um, uh, if you open pin an articulator or in a virtual articulator, you create a little discrepancy, may end up with a little more adjustment, but I can make Lucia Zip in like five minutes. So I thought that's just uh, saving time so I don't have to open and close. And also that occlusal guard, I had my lab technician made so, and I can, exactly tell them how much space I want so that I can make sure that it's not too thick or thin. What uh, brand of uh, scanners do you use at Marquette? Uh, as mentioned, we have a Plemeca 3Shape 3M and I Okay. Right. They all work great. Uh, a question on bonding. Uh, should adhesive be placed in on the intaglio of ceramic crowns prior to bonding? I've learned to leave out the intaglio and only place silane. So it depends on what kind of bonding system you use. There are bonding, you know, they have different protocols. Some bonding system will ask you to apply a PC first. Uh, some will not. This case, I think I use a 3M, Reliax 3M Ultimate. And that bonding system, you need to paint the adhesive first. But there are many other cement systems that does require painting adhesive. Okay, and this comes from a grad prof student, uh, Dr. Brian Brodeen. Is it better to scan the cast or scan the impression? Is it grad prof of UW? Uh, no, uh, oh, where's uh, Dr. Brodeen at? Uh, uh, different. Remember, sorry, Dr. Brodeen, it's slipping my yeah. mind right now. Uh, so theoretically, you know, if you pour stone model, there's an error that you're getting from stone expansion, right? But another thing is stone is a better surface to scan because the impression can be a little shiny. Um, so long story short, uh, the accuracy is compatible. Either you scan, but um, it, so it depends more on whether you have undercut or not. When you, have, when you try to scan impression outside a mouse, Sometimes there are some undercuts you cannot scan, especially when you have a tall preparation and thing like that. And then you don't have ability to cut dye, right? With an impression. So in a case like that, you would stone, uh, pour stone and scan it. And then when you have an implant case, you don't have a scan body that you can place an implant impression. You probably have to pour stone and then pour, um, place scan body on it. So. It's hard to give you a simple answer for that, but generally speaking, the accuracy can be uh, compatible about the same. Okay. And that uh, Dr. Brodeen's at uh, University of Tennessee Health Sciences Center uh, with uh, Dr. Tagna. Okay, yeah. it's a great program, yeah. Yeah, so uh, speaking of which, uh, can you answer a question for me? Why is the University of Washington uh, School of Dentistry grad pros program so good? <laughs> I think as, uh, I don't know, this is a very difficult question to answer because I have so many things to talk about. <laughs> I have another hour to talk about this, but uh, first of all, we had a great teacher. We had a um, um, great faculty members there. 
And also, I had a great colleague there, my classmate, um, you know, Yanis, Manuel, Armand, yeah. Carlota, you know, all of those, my friends and uh, classmates, we learned so much from each other. And then, um, you know, everybody's worked so hard. I was, I was in the lab in the midnight, and then, like, seven out of nine residents are there doing something. I was like, well, what do you do at midnight, <laughs> all right? So being in that kind of environment for three years really, really uh, makes your level of passion different, you know? So even after graduating, you feel like you still have to, I still sometimes work late midnight doing lab work, you know? I mean, it's just a habit that I got from grad Uh and so many talent and then, um, some, uh, like we have a good part-time faculty like Dr. Has, right? So, and many, uh, uh, yeah, so many great mentors there. But I think it's mostly it's about atmosphere. Everybody is so passionate and then help each other as well. Well, thank you again. We really appreciate you spending your time with us. Uh, it was really nice that you could expand on this lecture after hearing it in Chicago. I, I just wanted to hear it again. So thank you. We appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you very much. I have my uh, email here. So if any of you have any question, you can just directly send me an email. If I know answer, I'll try to answer. Dr. Hayamoto, will you jot that down and put that over in the chat side there, please? And I'm going to uh, uh, take uh, over the screen sharing. I'm going to put up our flyers again of upcoming courses. Keep in mind, uh, Dr. Fling will be starting uh, at 2.30. Uh, and uh, we will open that up about 10 minutes before so you can get logged in. And uh, again, we appreciate you spending time with us on the Washington AGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE uh, program. Your CE credits will be emailed to the email address that you use to register. There should be a PDF file that comes from the University of Washington. If you don't see it in two or three days, check your spam uh, folder. Uh, to register for upcoming courses, www.washingtonagd.org. We're recording all these webinars right now and they'll be available on YouTube for a period of time. You can go to Washington Academy of General Dentistry to our channel there on YouTube. Uh, like, subscribe, and click the bell to get notifications. Uh, for more information on our Master Track program, navigate to our webpage. Again, that's WashingtonAGD.org. Org. Uh, Dr. Yassin's going to be continuing his implant study club next week. We've got a great lineup of speakers next week that include Bill Robbins, Neil Grissetto, um, and uh, uh, Ian Tester, Mark Douglas, and it just goes on and on. So, uh, Again, these QR codes will help you get to the registration pages. We'd like to thank our friends in Canada at the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics for sharing these webinars with their members. Thank you, Comet USA, Patterson Dental, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, and Seattle King County Dental Society. We'd like to thank the International Academy of Nathology for putting together a group of speakers. Arkansas AGDs put together a great uh, list of speakers next Tuesday, including Dr. Richard Robley. And then we've got James Metz. And then we also have Bernie Villadego. So I'm interested to see his uh, photography that he does. Pretty exciting. Um, you can have your staff, staff members watch these live webinars also, and they can receive CE. So hygienists, assistants, uh, front desk, the, these uh, CE credits are available to you. Terry Harris is back next Wednesday. Uh, if you have questions for Terry Harris, uh, you can send those to the email that just went by. It's agd-covid at harrisbiomedical.net. All righty, with that, uh, you'll be receiving two hours of CE for this presentation today. Thank you very much for joining us. A big thank you to our panelists, Dr. Gary Hayamoto, to our webmaster, Dr. Presset, and to our executive director, uh, Valerie Bartoli. 
Thanks, guys, and thank you, Dr. Ann. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ann.